Okay, and we are, we are live. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for being with us on this webinar today. We have got Lee Subrathi from the Credit Ombud joining us today. So I'm sure there's going to be lots of valuable info being shared. Law, uh, th three weeks ago, around three weeks ago, we had Jimmy from the NCR, which was absolutely amazing. He gave us lots, lots of good information. And I'm sure you guys have got a lot of um, questions for Lee here from uh, the Credit Ombud. Obviously, since uh, since COVID started, there's been um, a lot of um, uncertainty when it comes to when it comes to our financial lives. A lot of people have been hit really hard by it, and I think a lot of people just don't know how to deal with um, creditors and what the laws are and what they need to do. And that's exactly why we have Lisa, uh, Lisa Brady joining us today. We had a, I had a discussion with Lee just before we got on this webinar, and we both shared our passion for helping South Africans, and we believe that with the right with the right information, us uh, South Africans will be in a much better place financially, and um, they'll also know how to deal with these companies. So let's get started. Um, what are, what's going to happen today is we are going to ask Lee a few questions, and then please remember to subscribe to this YouTube channel by clicking the subscribe button and clicking the bell icon to be notified whenever we do more videos like this. In the meantime, you guys can please post your questions. If you've got any questions for Lee, I'm sure you, you do. You can post it in the comment box. And at the end of the webinar, we will address some of the questions. So a quick note about Lee. Um, Lee is a head of department case management at the head office of the Credit Ombud. The credit ombud resolves complaints from consumers and businesses that are negatively impacted by credit, info, credit bureau information or when a consumer has a dispute with a credit bureau. So with that being said, uh, Lee, let's head over to you. You can tell us a little bit, a little bit more about the credit ombud and what you guys do. Firstly, David, thank you so much for, for allowing us to, to you know, just share a bit about consumer education, about our office on this platform, and uh, very good morning to everybody that's tuned in. So the credit the, the, the office of the credit on, but uh, many times uh, the, the title uh, seems to put consumers off. They don't really understand what an ombudsman may be or uh, what they hope an ombudsman to be in many instances. So essentially, we are a nonprofit organization that has been created many years ago to assist consumers in the credit industry. And a perfect example of that would be a consumer has a dispute with a credit provider or a credit bureau relating, the, relating to the information that reflects under their credit profile. In that instance, a consumer would then contact the office of the credit ombud to get involved, to liaise between the credit bureau, credit provider themselves, uh, and to get to the heart of the dispute. Remember, the, the heart of the office is dispute resolution between credit provider and consumer. So as an impartial body, and we remain impartial at all times, we sort of the mediator, the middleman that, that asks or rather requests, um, uh, makes requests for important information, asks specific questions to see exactly where the misconception is, to see exactly where the, uh, the heart of the dispute is so that we can resolve the matter, so that both parties live in a space whereby they've, they're, they're both, uh, their, uh, their concerns have been addressed and the fact that uh, they live in a, in a better space, so to speak. So yes, sir. Yeah. No, no, for sure. You can carry on. The, so this is going to go a little bit off topic here. Um, it's, it's not really part of the questions that I wanted to ask, but seeing that I've dealt with creditors myself and with these corporates, it is an absolute nightmare. You get sent from one call center agent to the next call center agent. How serious do they take you guys? So you, uh, so you, you must understand, we are a credit ombud, okay? We, we are office, we have our stakeholders. So imagine that you've got this big pool of credit providers. You've got the Credit Bureau Association, which is part of the credit ombud, our stakeholders. So we are the middleman. So a consumer will call in, we'll engage with them, we'll get to the heart of the dispute. A lot of times consumers call in in a state of, uh, of, of bewilderment, They're in a state where they've, they've been through the process, they've contacted multiple parties, they've been to customer service centers and so forth. So at the point of, of us, uh, accepting the complaint we have to now dissect the issues we need to find out exactly what is the state of the parties where has the complaint gone to where is the last point of contact that the consumer has had with the provider and we take it step by step from there from there unpacking the issues and try to say listen this is where we're at this is the issue that needs to be resolved how do we get to the point of resolution where the consumer's rights are being intact or rather being 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 uh, sort of uh, uh, protected at the same time balancing the rights of credit provider and the consumer. And then what, what if the if the creditors don't respond to you guys? What happens then? 
So remember, as part of the office, there is a terms of reference and a constitution that our members have to abide by. There's, uh, there's set turnaround times that a credit provider or a member is expected to give a response within. And we take the, the necessary measures. Remember, as the Office of the Credit Ombud, we do have the powers of making recommendations, making rulings, provided that they are warranted in the circumstances. And the most important thing that as part of our, how can I say, our mission statement is transparency, fairness, responsibility. You know, it's about balancing the rights. So as long as a member, as long as we are adjudicating on a dispute where a member is involved, there's no doubt about it that we will get a response. I mean, with our, with the current times with COVID and stuff, with a lot of people working from home, we know that there has been delays that have been experienced. But at the end of the day, it's about resolving the issue. And where there are, and where a consumer is liable, we will we will relay that in terms that are understandable for the consumer because remember, it's not about being pro-consumer. It's not about being pro-credit provider. It's about balancing the rights of both parties. But we will endeavor and we will try our best to get matter resolved within the, the, the necessary timeframes. And we will ensure that the rights of all parties are intact and are, um, and are sort of uh, yeah, enforced at all times. Yes, yeah, so I think you you already answered my first question, which was, um, what, what is the role between the creditor and the ombuds? I think you explained that very well. I think maybe I can move on to the next question is, so when, when does someone engage you guys or when do they engage the NCR? Okay, in anything, there's a process to follow. I think in anything in both in the credit industry and I think in life in general is that you give the party a chance to respond. Yes, um, yes. And, and uh, so if I could give any sort of advice to consumers and even in terms of our process, so our process is quickly at the office. So we have two types of disputes. Uh, now we get into obviously the meat of what we do. Uh, we deal with non-bank credit agreement disputes and credit information disputes. Okay. Now, what is your non-bank credit disputes? That's your disputes whereby you as a consumer are unsure of the interest. You're unsure whether an account uh, has prescribed. We know the laws of prescription and we know that, mm. the, that, the, that the different interpretations that applies with the law of prescription. Uh, in instances where your, your proof of payments are not reflecting on your account or in general you're unhappy about the cost on the account and you need a further explanation about it. Is the credit provider charging me correctly? Are they charging me the correct fees and interest in terms of the National Credit Act? If it's related directly to the account itself on its own, then it's regarded as a non-bank credit agreement. And non-bank has been specifically tailored that way is because we do not deal with accounts relating to a bank. Any of the big banks, we don't get involved in that. We have the Ombudsman for Banking Services that deals with those yes. matters. So those are non-bank credit agreements, okay? Now, with credit information disputes, and I think that goes to the heart of this broadcast and obviously your credit status and your credit health and so forth. Remember, your credit information and your information that's held on the credit bureau is essentially your passport or your identity in the credit world. It can either determine if you get employment in certain instances. It can determine whether or not you are granted vehicle finance, home finance, a credit card to purchase day-to-day -day groceries and so forth. So it, it has quite significant importance in one's life. So as the Office of the Credit Ombud, we engage to ensure that information is factual and as, uh, and as correct as possible. But before one can log a complaint with the Office of the Credit Ombud, there's a process to follow. The consumer will first need to engage with the credit bureau or the credit provider, depending on what sort of matter it is, and allow them 20 business days to investigate the complaint. Now, 20 business days seems like a lifetime to someone who's quite desperate and someone obviously is left in the lurch. We know that, but, but the 20 days is necessary. And, 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 and we really motivate this is because you must understand credit providers, they, we, we, we're speaking of, of conglomerates you're speaking of big organizations who have multiple wheels turning at once different branches that need to speak to each other in many instances collections need to speak to marketing that needs to speak to to the to to just a corner office that deals with statements of account for example they all need to work together so we allow those 20 business days to ensure that the credit provider or credit bureau in this instance has taken the time to look at the matter and get back to the consumer if after the 20, or rather, if within the 20 business days, either you receive a response that you are not happy about or you don't agree with, or if 20 business days has passed and you have not received a response, then a consumer is more than welcome to contact the Office of the Credit Ombud with a reference number. Remember, it's always important, regardless of whether you are returning a shirt or you are returning a product or you're simply querying about the charges of the account, take down the details of the people you speak to their ranking in the organization, take down telephone numbers, dates, and times, because in the, in the end, when the ombud is looking at the coherent circumstances, looking at all of the facts to obviously come to some sort of resolution, these facts and details are of vital importance. So come to us with that information, and as long as you follow the process, we will engage with the credit provider or the bureau, and we'll endeavor to resolve the dispute as speedily as possible.
Yes, I, I think you, you touched on something very important there. I think a lot of the people, a lot of people, when they've got informa- incorrect information, they just immediately jump and then they go to what they want to start um, you know, disputing information at uh, the credit ombud or NCR. But we always tell them it's very important go to the creditor first because it's a lot easier getting it resolved by going to the creditor. I mean, if they know they're in the wrong, then they have to correct it. According to the law, they have to correct it. And if you are not happy with that, then go to the credit bureau because that is the obvious next step to do. If it's something that's that's incorrect, the credit bureau has to prove it, right? So if the credit bureau can't prove that it's factual, that it's, it is correct information, then they have to remove it anyway. So it's a lot easier than jumping the gun and going to the credit bureau. But now, so so when when does a consumer go to the credit ombud, or when do they go to the NCR? Then, so what is the difference between between the two? What kind of information gets disputed by the the ombud, and what information gets disputed by the NCR? That's actually a very interesting question because I'm sure for a consumer who's not really obviously uh, exposed to these sort of things on a day-to-day basis, it would be quite confusing to them. I mean, the, the National Credit Regulator is established in terms of the National Credit Act. They are a regulator in terms of the act. Uh, they are the uh, the body to which credit providers need to subscribe or need to register with to act as a credit provider. We know that as long as you grant any, uh, you, as, you, as long as you grant credit, uh, you have to be registered as a credit provider to act in that sort of manner. Uh, if you're a credit bureau, you need to register with the credit with the national credit regulator. So they are the regulatory authority. The Office of the Credit Ombud is a voluntary organization association that was created to resolve disputes specifically for consumers between our members and the and the uh, and the and the credit providers so how how does it work how does it work between the two i would say and this is how the approach we've always taken in fact we are currently engaging on ways on dealing with the national credit regulators so that we as officers can obviously support one another assist one another so that remember at the end of the day it's about consumer education it's about a dispute resolution it's about uh, providing that method of redress that many times fall within the treating customers fairly principles that uh, as we understand it's about providing consumers with the option of resolving the dispute let's face it me as a consumer at any point when i'm in a point of distress i don't care whether it's 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 10 organizations that i need to go to and we have experiences where consumer <laughs> will go to multiple organizations to resolve a dispute i mean at times we've seen uh, emails where consumers cc 15 organizations is because it doesn't no come way. from a place of, of intent. It comes from a place of, of, um, of uh, how can I say this, of need. It comes from a place yeah, where desperate. they just want to be helped. It's, they're desperate. It comes from a place of desperation. They just want to be assisted. Remember, these are consumers' lives we're speaking about. Yeah, I mean, impact. And many consumers, I know we live, they live day to day. I mean, it's day to day living. And, and, and 100 rand can make a big difference in their lives. So we have to look at it from their side of view. So the National Credit Regulator is the regulator in terms of the act. They have been established to register credit providers to deal with the systemic issues of compliance of the National Credit Act and so forth. The Office of the Ombud has been established for dispute resolution, for consumer education. We are there to assist a consumer as long as we they, as long as the, the dispute is against one of our members, we endeavor to act as fairly, as responsibly, as transparent as possible to get down to the issues. And if it comes to a point where we say, listen, the parties have reached a stalemate, they've reached a headblock, we say, get the parties around the table. And we tell them, listen, these are, these are the issues on the table. How do we resolve this matter? How do, we, how do we portray the issues of fairness, of transparency, and so forth? So it's all about engagement. No two cases are the same. I personally will tell you that because I'm personally involved in the case management uh, because we're dealing with different people, we're dealing with different characteristics, different personalities, and so forth. It's a day-by-day struggle. However, the national... So this is how consumers should view it. The, regulate, the NCR as a regulator, the ombud as a dispute resolution um, sort of... Uh, a uh, company that has been created to to offer that method of redress for the consumer between members and, and and consumers, but they sort of have to work hand in hand because that is how the industry has evolved. Uh, I hope I've answered or provided clarity in, in that. Respect. Yes, you did actually. Uh, so I think it's safe to say that if you've got any dispute, it's a lot easier to go to the credit ombud and get your your dispute resolved by them um, because, like you said, you said that that is what you guys deal with. Like solely, you you deal with disputes, whereas the um, the NCR deal with a multiple um, a, you know, bunch of things and they are there to to obviously regulate the credit bureaus and to regulate the creditors and make sure they um, abide by the law while you, well, while you guys only handle disputes. So I think it's for the listeners listening, if you've got any dispute, if you couldn't get it resolved by going to the creditor or the credit bureau, I think it's safe to say then that the credit um, ombud is your next stop. I think you said very something very important there as well. Um, maybe you guys working hand in hand. 
I think it'll be amazing if we can sometime in the future get you guys to like maybe do some kind of system together where all of these things can sort of happen automatically. A person can do all the disputes online. It can happen automatically in the background and just get it uh, done faster. At the moment, I think it's still a very, very manual process for you guys. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, it is quite labor intensive at the moment. And I mean, like uh, I can I can quite uh, confidently say is that there has been a lot of engagement between the, the national credit regulator and the credit arm. But at the end of the day, it's about creating a, a stable industry. It's about creating. And I mean, you will understand that in as much as in as much as there's there's thousands of accounts that are open on a daily basis. Disgruntled consumers and disputes, obviously, still is it's something that we can't, we cannot ignore, and it's something that needs to be also given the equal equal side of uh, of importance. Is because it, as much as a consumer can open an account, at the same time, there's the same amount of consumers who are disputing accounts, consumers who are disgruntled. And remember, in addition to that, and goes hand in hand with that, is consumer education. An informed consumer, a much more educated consumer in the credit space, will understand how interest is charged, will understand how an account is handed over. We know debt collection is a major sort of, uh, is a major industry. It's, it affects every account, whether it's your simple plumbing account all the way to your actual credit agreement. Debt collection sort of penetrates into every industry and every sort of, uh, sort of sphere. So it's important that consumers are made aware of the different debt collection methods, especially in terms of the National Credit Act, is because it will inevitably affect the credit profile. It would affect their finances and quite possibly it can lead to attachments and so forth. So a point of reference the earlier you act in any instance, the better is because you can address legal costs, you can address uh, possible, you can prevent possible attachments. It's about engaging with the consumers. We know with, with COVID and we know that with the, with, the, with, the, with the disastrous sort of state that we're in in terms of financial statuses of many consumers, um, things like payment holidays, understanding how payment holidays work, understanding the cost and interest that are attached to payment holidays. It's these sort of things that consumers need to get to grip to grips with is because sometimes, and we know, I, I mean, as a consumer, Sometimes when you receive something, you want to put your head in the sand and run away, hopefully it disappears, only to realize that you're facing a mountain in six months' time. So our duty and our responsibility as the regulators, as the ombuds in the industry and any other sort of entity that's dealing with similar sort of disputes is to educate and to try to prevent rather than cure. Prevention is always better than cure because you're in a better state of mind, you're better in the state financially, and you're able to address you know, your future circumstances as, as best as you can. I couldn't agree more. I, I, I think you touched on the, you hit the nail on the head there with consumer education. If, if a consumer gets educated, that's how they, that, that's how they better their lives. And unfortunately, with, with financial information, especially when you get these contracts, I mean, I, I'm going to be honest, no one really reads the terms and conditions because if they want a personal loan, they want that personal loan. If they want a home loan, they want the home loan. They're not going to sit and read through the fine print and read through all the extra costs that gets involved. And the costs are over in so, some instances, it's, it's so disguised that you actually don't know what those costs are until you start repaying it and then only seeing then what you actually are paying. So I think it's, uh, I, I think that's very important is for, for consumers to be educated properly. And I mean, face it, we don't, we don't learn this stuff in school. We, we learn algebra and all that stuff. We don't learn about personal finance, about interest, how interests are calculated what kind of dates are bad, what kind of dates are considered not as bad. But yeah, that's the biggest problem. In not in, and it's not only a South African problem, it's a worldwide problem. I mean, we're sitting with the same schooling system that we've had when, in, 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 since the start of the industrial age, and that's why school started. And I think, think that's why we're sitting with the biggest problem. I actually asked um, Jimmy from the NCR three weeks ago, do they plan on, on, con, on educating consumers? And they also shared their passion about this. And they also said that they're very passionate about consumer education. And that they actually are planning some kind of platform to teach um, people about personal finances, and um, yeah, that's that's exactly what we've been doing on this web on these webinars as well. We've been teaching people how how home loans work, how vehicle finance work, how the interest gets calculated on it, and, I, and it's very very important for people to know this stuff because if they don't know the kind of interest involved with this, that's usually where they get themselves into and the problems later on. Like you said, then they're facing a mountain instead of just a minor. A minor problem and that's also why we tell people to check your credit reports often because i mean there's so many uh, so many identity frauds um or identity fraud happening in in south africa it's i think in the we did a webinar this uh, or not a webinar we did a video a little while ago which where it says it's, it's, it's you know, it, identity theft has been up tremendously in COVID. so obviously these scammers have been have taken COVID and taken advantage of that to um you know, to steal people's identity 
And the quickest way to, to, to notice that is if you get your credit reports, because if there's inquiries, extra inquiries on your credit report, then you know it's not you. And dealing it with it then is a lot easier than dealing with it six months down the line. Yeah, I mean, we we advocate a constant uh, sort of, uh, how can I say, it's assessment of your credit profile, your credit report. Even, I mean, I'm guilty of this, right? I mean, I've got a private email and all my accounts go to my private email. And to say the truth, sometimes we get so busy with life that we don't even check the emails that are coming in. We don't even check the deduction that goes off your bank statement. Get into the habit and what we, what we advocate, get into the habit of going through your bank statements once a month because ultimately if money is going to come out of your account, it will come out from there. On the flip side of that, you have to check your credit report is because it is quite possible that you may be a victim of fraud. And I understand that you will never know until you finally go and see your dream house that you're sitting before the bond originator. And when they do a credit check on you and then you realize there's a flag on your report, then you realize, but I don't have any flags on my report. And then they'll pick up the <laughs> flag and say, well, listen, there's the flag right here. It's because you haven't been diligent in checking your credit report. And we know that life does get quite busy. It gets very busy. But the important thing is that we have to continuously check our credit statuses. We have to continue check our bank statement, check your pay slip, check everything is because at the end of the day, all the all of the tiny cents count. And ask relevant questions. As a consumer, you are entitled to questions, you are entitled to results, you are entitled to answers. So make sure you ask the necessary questions. And, and most importantly, most importantly, you have to you have to you have to put in a budget. Make sure that you put in a budget. Because the budget is most important because it will tell you what disposable income you have and it gives you the ability to be informed as to what you can do going forward with your finances. I couldn't agree more. So we've got another um, a, a side of our business called Global Money Academy where we educate people on personal finances. And um, a year, about a month ago, we were on the Morning Espresso show and we were talking about budgeting there. And it's amazing how, how many people say they know budgeting, but they don't actually do it. But it's such an important thing. If you take your monthly expenses and you start putting it into certain percentages or in percentages, then you see, can see exactly where you are overspending. And it's such an easy thing. It's, it's the, the easiest way to save money is by budgeting and cutting your unnecessary expenses. It's a lot easier than making more money. <laughs> it's, 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 it's about information. And unfortunately... I don't think you can have too much information when it comes to your personal finances. And I mean, and, and you know, we, we, we kind of spoil for choice these days. We know a lot of the banks and a lot of the applications that we have on our phones, it sort of, it sort of does credit tracking. It sort of does uh, expense tracking. It tells you whether you're a good spender, you're a bad spender, what areas have you overcompensated this month for. And I mean, that's how you evolve is by, is by taking it month to month. So this is my advice and this is what I've done personally. I take a simple Excel spreadsheet. I put on my expenses on one side, I put on my income on the other side. And once those expenses are gone, then I know how much of money I have in that little pot I have to save and how much I have to do, to, to, uh, to spend. And we know in these times, we have to become more prudent in the way we save, if we are able to save, in the way we deal with finances. Because at the end of the day, it's about you never know how, how the future will sort of navigate itself. But it's important to know what you have now. And I don't think that you can have too much information. And it's about, it's about and, uh, uh, another sort of tip that we've realized is that sometimes Sometimes use your finances to pay off the smaller debts so that you can pay off the bigger debts quicker. Because once you free up the little bit of income, and some people may think, no, but it'll be, it'll, it, it's not worth it, you know. Maybe do the physical calculation and, and you actually might be quite shocked to see exactly what figure that you come up with at the end of the month. Uh, and it boils down, to, the bottom line is that the more information you have on your day-to-day -day expenses, the better decisions you can make for next month and the month after that and put projections in place and put goals and targets in place. And that will obviously assist you in reaching those goals. Yeah, exactly. So we had a webinar with Carfin the other day and, and he actually said something very funny. He said that your credit, your credit history or your credit um, life is more, is the most important thing in your life, ex except for your financial, uh, for your, for your like personal health first. So <laughs> he's, yeah, yeah. yeah, according to him, it was the second most important thing in your life. So personally, I like the, the envelope budgeting system. So what, how that works is, you know, in the old days, like our fathers or grandfathers, they used to take these envelopes because they obviously didn't have um, credit cards like we do right now, right? So they took their monthly pay and then they divided it up into envelopes. So let's say utilities, rent, and then they would pay out of those envelopes. And then if the envelope's empty, it's empty. There's nothing left to spend. And that's why they were so much better than in, in money management than what we've got now. Now it's so easy. You just take out a card, tap it. Even in COVID, it's more easier because now they ask you, hey, don't you want to tap here instead? It's a lot easier. 
yeah, I think that, it's that, that plastic. Yeah, that plastic card doesn't have an indicator on it, so you never know. You know, it's bottomless until it's not bottomless anymore. So yeah. you just have to you just have to manage it, and management is the best tool. I mean, and and you know what? Uh, we uh, the reality of life is that a lot of consumers have found themselves in sometimes the situations that uh, that they seem that uh, there's no hope. But you have to reach out to an ex, reach out to someone who can assist. I think the most important thing in those situations that a lot of consumers find themselves is that knowledge is power. And the sooner you try to find what avenues and what options are available to you, the sooner you can try to repair your credit record, your credit profile that leads to a better future for you and your family at the end of the day. That's the most important. No, exactly. It's like that quote, you can't, you can't expect change to happen if you keep doing the same thing. For sure. Definitely. Definitely. So let me get on to the next question, and we, you know, we, we, we will be sitting here talking for ages about personal finance <laughs> if we if we get stuck on that on that subject. Sure. So Lee, can only registered credit providers send payment behavior to credit bureaus, or can any company with a SACRA membership send consumer data to them? So from so from our understanding, I mean, the South African Credit Risk and Reporting Association has been created for that for the for that instance for to for obviously for the integrity of data to find out obviously better methods of reporting. So it's an association that whereby there's a lot of members that are attached to it. And from my understanding, it's that um, it's not only credit providers that submit information to the credit bureaus. It's anybody that's willing to share information. Remember, it's about risk. It's about risk, and it can go all the way from your insurance products, from my understanding, all the way down to credit. Uh, in many instances, other services like sometimes your your entertainment services on a monthly basis is all of those things that uh, that, uh, for my understanding, as long as you are willing to submit and receive information, you can you can subscribe to these credit bureaus to 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 reflect that information. And I think it goes on a reciprocal basis that uh, the, the more information I share, or rather, when I share information, I then have the right to use the information that you are holding in your hub so that I can make better and informed decisions for my own personal circumstances. And remember, as a credit provider, you are required in terms of the act, uh, in terms of Section 80 to Section 82, to, to prevent reckless lending. Now, you prevent reckless lending by assessing the, the circumstances, not only from the, from the current finances that a consumer has, but also in terms of the history their propensity to pay up the account. This is not only to ensure that the, that the consumer can afford it, but it's also to protect your own risk as a credit provider or a service provider. Because remember, you are running a business and your business is dependent on receiving that income, that money from the consumer on a month-to-month -month basis in order to, to, in order to make your business survive and to make your business thrive. So it's a reciprocal obligation. And as much as a credit provider has to assess the affordability of a consumer, the credit bureau information is one of the tools that is used to assess the credit score, to assess the credit health of that customer. So uh, from, a, from a South African, from a, from a credit information point of view, I, uh, according to my understanding, uh, it's not limited. Uh, if you subscribe to a bureau, you're allowed to exchange information with them and you're entitled. But of course, you have to conform to their rules. And I think one of the fundamental points is that the purpose of these bureaus is to list factual information. And information and information needs to be at the most important needs to be needs to needs to fact check, uh, fact check and ensure that the information is as authentic and as factual as possible because it's about it's about listing information that's pure uh, so that you can assess the actual circumstances that the consumer finds themselves as at this time. Yes, I think you said something very important there. A lot of people, when they check their credit score, they get extremely angry with the credit bureaus for having incorrect listings or incorrect stuff on the credit reports. But you guys need to understand that the credit bureau is only the custodian of the data. It doesn't add the data on there. It doesn't alter the data really. It just takes data from SACRA, the creditors or, or, or whichever, whoever company is part of SACRA, sends the data to SACRA, SACRA distributes it to the credit bureaus and they basically display what they get, to, what, what they, um, get sent. So let's assume there is a manual error with a credit with, with a creditor. They send the incorrect listing through to SACRA. Then that incorrect listing will appear on your credit on your credit report. And it won't help getting angry with the credit bureau because the credit bureau is simply a custodian of this data. So, like we said in, uh, earlier in this in this webinar, what you need to do then is go to the creditor, inform them of the mistake. They will then correct it. And if they cannot, or if you're not happy with it. Then go to the credit bureau. If you're not, if you can't reach an outcome with them, then you go to um, to Lee and them at the credit ombud to get your issue resolved with them. Yes, I mean, remember, if I'm, if I, I do stand, I, I do stand corrected, but I think we have around 25 million active credit consumers. 
uh, uh, that's in South Africa. And remember, now remember the amount of accounts that credit providers need to submit to on a monthly mm. basis. And that's millions and millions of lines and profiles and data. At any given time, a portion of the data is something is going to happen. I mean, uh, because I mean, uh, that is why these mechanisms of resolving disputes have been created to address that very point. And again, it all boils down to how quickly do you act? And you can only act as quick as information available to you, which means doing a monthly check on your profile, doing a monthly check on your credit status. And I mean, you'll, you'll see that the more consistent you are with your payments, the more consistent you are with the way you deal with your finances that affect your credit profile, the healthier your score will be. Um, exactly. It's just, it, it, it comes down to having good, good habits, good financial habits. If you, if you start getting your habits in order or getting, getting better um, money management ha habits, paying your stuff on time, checking your credit score monthly, then essentially the byproduct of that will be a greater or better credit score. Yes, and especially when it comes to dispute resolution, like for like we, like you mentioned this earlier, fraud is quite prevalent not only in South Africa but mm. around the world. At any given time, somebody can either uh, do a basic you can be a victim of identity fraud. There are mechanisms of dealing with fraud. You can be listed as as a fraud indicator on your credit profile if you can voluntarily list yourself if you feel that you have been a victim of identity theft. So, uh, and I don't think any situation is too subtle. I think as soon as you suspect that there's fraud on your account, contact your providers, contact the necessary people so that you can start that process so that you prevent people from, because, because just imagine this, that I am a victim of fraud and I suspect something fishy is going on. If I go and list myself, obviously as being under, under a fraud listing and so forth, then at least if anybody's doing a credit check on my profile by even a, a person who's trying to scam me, they will see, listen, there's an, indicating, there's an indicator on here saying, listen, possible fraud, you know, I need to be wary of the person I'm dealing with. Let me request more information. Let me possibly uh, report that person that's trying to get credit on somebody else's name. It's just about alert all the relevant parties and putting in controls in place so that you uh, the extent to which you have been a victim is limited I think uh, ho hopefully to a point that you're not affected financially that's a hundred percent I think it comes down to taking action and not sitting around doing nothing yeah, for sure. so Lee my next question so so Africans get spammed daily by sales, sales agents trying to sell them certain services since it happens unexpectedly there is no way for the consumer to record the phone call. So what happens if you wish to have a copy of this call in the future and the creditor doesn't give you access to it? What exactly are the options then? Remember, as a, as a consumer, and in terms of the National Credit Act, it's listed out from Section 60 onwards in the National Credit Act, it gives you a list of rights. And you as a consumer have a right to a copy of any contract or basically the recording that's setting out that, that, uh, that agreement. Now remember, in the current times that, we, that, that we're in, a lot of stuff has not been done manually. A lot of stuff is done electronically. It's done uh, via uh, a telephone recording. So all of these things are required to be recorded in a necessary sort of format. It needs to be, it needs to be kept. It needs to be saved. It needs to be uh, uh, filed at some place, wherever it is. But it must be accessible. And as, and as a consumer, any consumer has a right to a copy of the agreement that they have bound themselves to. And another important point is that a consumer who, who willingly uh, sort of binds themselves to agreement without understanding the necessary costs, the necessary implications, the legal consequences, obviously has to bear the brunt of the eventual consequences should that, should that agreement obviously play out, you know, uh, and which is why as a, as, a, as a customer, as a consumer, ensure that you understand every term, the, the terms and conditions, understand the, the cost of credit, understand the pre-quotation, understand what's expected of you before you commit yourself to that agreement. Um, but I mean, to answer your question, sorry, I, I, I digress. Uh, you are no, entitled to a copy of that recording if it binds you to the agreement. I mean, it's your, it's your, it's your, ba it's a basis to which you commit yourself, and a, and a provider is obliged to give you a copy or to set out at least in a written format exactly what you have bound yourself to. So yes, you are, you and, are entitled to a copy of it. So, and if they cannot give you that cop the copy of that recording, is that contract then null and void? No, uh, unfortunately not. So remember, let's let, let let's play this out realistically. If I as a consumer, uh, if if I if I go through my statement and I say, wait, something seems a bit off here. I mean, why is my interest so high? It could be very, it could very well be the correct interest, but you obviously uh, uh, may have forgotten the interest rate you that you committed yourself to. Or you need to go back to the contract, and let's say they haven't sent you a copy of the contract, or that you don't have a copy of the recording. That doesn't necessarily invalidate the contract, is because remember. Um, you 
binding yourself to a contract is different from you having a copy of the contract. So that won't render the contract null and void. What will then need to happen is that you will need to then now take steps to try and get hold of that recording. And you follow the process. You contact the provider and tell them, listen, uh, I, I can't recall or rather I've lost the email that you sent to me setting out the terms and conditions and the interest rates and stuff. Can you send it to me? Can you give me a copy of it or can you make it available for me to listen to? I mean, I just want to see what I, what I consented to. And if that doesn't work out, you follow the steps. You contact the credit provider. If they don't assist you, you contact the credit on but we have been in the past i mean we engage with our credit providers they are required our stakeholders are required to give us the information to adjudicate on the dispute so that we can reach a resolution and we will create the we will create the means by which a consumer can be given the documentation or that they can have a listen to the recording so that they can satisfy themselves as to what they consented or rather what they contracted to uh, which then speaks to the charges that they are being billed for every month Yes, and I think, as, as you rightfully said as well, if you start going down this route, make sure you document everything in the process, put down the dates in an Excel spreadsheet. That's what I prefer. So um, one, of, one of our videos um, on our platform, we educate people on the correct dispute process. And one of that is set up an Excel spreadsheet, put the time there, put the date there, who you spoke to, what the outcome is, is, was. And then every time you speak to someone or have any kind of communication with someone at the the, with the credit bureau or credit provider, whoever it is, then document it in the spreadsheet. I think that's the easiest way to, to keep track of things. Let's put it this way. Um, a better and clearer argument, a better and clearer case is obviously made up of consistent and chronological list of events. If I as a consumer say, listen, I've been to the provider on this date, this time, I've spoken to this person, this is what has happened in the last three weeks. It creates a fuller case. It gives your, it gives your, it gives credibility to your version of events. As opposed to just coming and saying, no, listen, I've spoken to someone. I can't remember their name. I went probably three weeks ago. I can't remember the time. You know, it just sort of creates, even though you maybe obviously have an authentic complaint, just that a bigger and a stronger case by, is by building up this sort of file or building up this, this trail of evidence, it just gives you a better, a better platform within which to voice your complaint. And it makes it easier for authorities like the regulator, for, for our officers and any other sort of office that's there to assist the consumer in the method of redress. Yes. Yeah, so on the flip side of that, let's assume you you cancel a contract via phone because many creditors prefer that, that you don't send them an email and that you actually phone in to cancel whatever contract that is. What happens then if the creditor, if there's a manual error on their site and they don't cancel the contract, they keep billing you for, for the contract and later down the line, it just keeps happening and they do, don't do anything about that. What 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 is the options then or what are the options for for you as a consumer yeah well like i'm saying method of just remember part of the investigation and we as the office of the ombud we will ask the questions on what date did the consumer cancel the agreement and let's say for some instance a credit provider doesn't have record of the agreement being cancelled then we will raise and and this is where it's so important to keep details is because it may well be in fact that there's a system error that they can't pick up the call recording or they can't pick up the, trans the transactions. And if we can provide uh, obviously a set of events that that makes it quite probable, the credit provider will look into that. And you, and you must remember and and you 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 obviously raise quite an important point that I think we should not ignore. It's settling an account versus closure of an account and this is has become quite contentious in recent times in that a consumer simply when they want to settle an account they simply look at the statement that they received two weeks ago and think that the balance outstanding on that statement is the balance they need to pay to settle that account and the act is quite clear is that for you to settle an account and to bring the balance to zero so to speak is that you have to contact the credit provider is because interest is charged daily and it's compounded monthly. Remember, the days of a credit provider accelerating interest and charging you for future interest is over. The act is quite clear is that you can only be billed for the interest as of today. So if I took a loan agreement 30 days ago and I want to settle it now on the 30th day, I can only be charged for interest for that period of 30 days and not for the balance of the contract that's 11, 12 or 24 months or whatever it is. So interest is, is calculated daily. But remember, if my statement dated two weeks ago and I want to settle two weeks later, there's 14 days of interest that hasn't been taken into account technically, and this is where consumers sometimes get it wrong. So as a, as a, as a suggestion, if you want to settle an account, the day you want to settle, contact the credit provider, find out what is the current outstanding balance owing at that moment, and if any possible future debit orders are still going to go, going to go off or not go off. What we have found many times is that consumers will, for example, uh, think or they believe that I've settled my account today and my debit order that's scheduled on the 25th is not going to go off, so I'll simply reverse it. And what happens? They reverse the debit order and the account goes into default. 
And the second point, and sorry, uh, you can stop it anytime if I'm... If I'm no, 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 go ahead. It's, it's good information you're giving out. Yeah, yeah. So the second point, most important point is closing the account. Remember, with credit facilities, they are facility. They, they are meant to, to operate in a sense where I can use and buy and pay back on an ongoing basis for an inevitable uh, period of time. It doesn't have to end at a certain point. But remember, you're being charged monthly service fees. You're being charged maybe other insurance products that you may be not aware of or that you are aware of or have forgotten about at some point in time. So even though to your mind, you might have a zero balance this month and say, listen, I won't use my account for six months, but I'll keep it as a backup plan if I need to buy something in six months time. And six months down the line, you realize you have six months worth of service fees that has the account balance is maybe 300 or 400 rands. Remember, if you want to close an account, make sure you close that account. Request closure of the account. Because failure to do so will result in you incurring service fees and a credit provider is entitled in terms of the act and in terms of the agreement which you consent to, to charge you that service fee because it's there for, it's for, it's for administration purposes. But, but not to digress too much off your point, at the end of the day, you have to ensure that your account is settled according to the correct balances and that it's paid up and that it's closed if you wish for it to be closed. Uh, there's a very big difference between the two. And, and I hope consumers obviously uh, will look into that when they are considering settling balances versus closing up of accounts. Yes, I think that was really, really informative now. And um, we actually had a question like that coming up yesterday on one of our YouTube videos. Is a person asked, how can he, he yes, he had, a, he had a personal loan with Capitec. He settled the, the amount on the statement, but then he saw he's, he, he still had 70 Rand outstanding. And if, it's, if it will impact his credit score. And yes, if he doesn't do anything about it, it will impact his credit score. But that most probably happened because of what you just said. Obviously, interest occurring, and there was interest from where he was where he's sitting now, and the date or the statement that he last received. So I think that was that was really good information you gave. There's request the settlement amount from the company when you settle the amount. Ask for the account closure um, agreement as well, or not agreement. Um, the letter letter stating that the account is closed. That has actually actually happened to me before. I closed an account at a bank, and um, a, a year later, I received a statement um, where it incurred int interest. And then the, I simply just went to them. I told them, "Listen, yeah, I closed the account. So, um, and I actually paid to close the account. Funny enough. <laughs> so, how can that be?" And they immediately just corrected it because, um, like we said, if 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 you followed the correct pro process, then there's no need for the creditor um, not to honor the agreement. Yes, and 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 we know, like especially from last year, with the, with with credit providers, sometimes in some instances going beyond for consumers above and beyond by 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 implementing things like payment holidays and stuff. These things impact your your account inevitably. So it's about engagement. It's about alerting the credit provider as to what you're disgruntled about. And I'm sure because remember, they are in the business to keep you as a customer, and uh, very seldom will they push you away or say, "Listen, we don't want to assist you." And that is where then we offer that method of redress. And it's just about getting together and resolving the dispute as speedily as possible. Yes, exactly. So, Lee, I'm going to ask you one more question and then we can answer some of the questions. I see there's a few here. And thank you very much for the for, for the people at the Credit Ombud. I see, I assume that it's um, some of the staff working there at the Credit Ombud that has been answering some of the questions for our users on this webinar. So thank you very much for that. We really appreciate it. Um, it's really helpful for, for the other users as well to um, get the information on you. If a person lost the income because of COVID and can't fulfill their credit obligations, can a creditor blacklist them after the consumer actually did go to them and explain the whole situation? So this is a bit of a, of a tricky question. I mean, <laughs> at the end of the day, I mean, I mean, there's a, because of course, there, there, there's a, there's a sort of business way of looking at it and there's a consumer way of looking at it. I mean, as a mm. consumer, I mean, we know a lot of people have lost their jobs. There's been a lot of retrenchments. And then what happens when you, when you lose your income? You lose, you, you lose your inability to service an account. Now, credit providers, remember, they can only sort of extend their, their sort of leniency to a certain extent before the debt starts to become a bad debt, before it starts to become a written off debt. So to answer your question is that, I mean, the National Credit Act was created to basically create balances between consumer rights and the credit provider. And a credit provider, as long as a consumer has been in default for more than three consecutive months, uh, and the credit provider is required to send you a notice, it's Regulation 19, uh, to say, listen, that you are in default. If you don't bring the account up to date within 20 business days, we are going to go to the credit bureau 
to uh, to list you as a default. So yes, unfortunately, they can do that. You see, there's, there's, there's various different ways the situation can be interpreted. And one of the situations is that the credit provider is being unfair towards me and uh, they don't want to give me leniency. Now, sometimes you need to put ourselves in sometimes the shoes of the credit provider. I mean, imagine if we have a million consumers who stop paying the accounts. I mean, that can have obviously disastrous effects to the company itself. So it's about, it's about I think, a collaborative uh, uh, sort of uh, effort. I think a credit provider will appreciate a consumer that's coming to them early enough to say, listen, this is a situation. Is there a possible payment holiday? Is there a possible extension of the term? Can you reduce my statement? I mean, many consumers sometimes have credit insurance that can cover that period or loss of income and they don't know about it. So go, you have to go back to your agreement. Look, do I have a credit insurance? Is it covered? Is it not covered? When is it covered? Do I consider taking it out for the future? It's those sort of things. Um, it's, it's very important. And um, But the reality is that if you are in default, a credit provider can list you. And let's think of it from a different side for a moment. Remember that listing is to also alert other entities of your status so that you protect them as well. Um, and there may be instances where you are maybe a victim of fraud. And I mean, uh, that default in many, in some instances could possibly save you from incurring unnecessary debt on your profit that you don't know about, you know. So there are, there are sort of, from a consumer's point of view, there are sort of pros and cons. But that's why we have to always default back to the Act. What does the Act say? The Act was created to instill fairness. So as long as we are complying with the Act, in a sense, we are being fair to both credit provider and credit consumer. But believe me, we totally understand. I mean, we had consumers who literally come to the office in, in, in a state where they, they, you know, they're very emotional. It's because your finances affect your emotion. They affect your life. They affect your family life, your ability to provide for your family. And our, our, our suggestion and the, what we always try to put forward to consumers is, and like many times we have reiterated on this call, is that it's always have to act as early as possible. As soon as you get a letter of retrenchment, even the notice of a consultation, contact your credit providers immediately. Get your finances in order. Because I think a credit provider will appreciate a consumer who's come to them in a state where they're not in default. And then they can look at term extensions and look at ways that they can, they can try to, to assist you. Uh, no, 100%. I think it's like we said earlier as well. Many people, when something like that happens, they tend to bury their head in the ground, then hoping for the situation or for the problem to go away. And we always tell them, no, go, go to the creditor, explain to them what happened, try and negotiate a settlement with them. Because they need to understand that the creditor will rather take something of a little bit of something than 100% of nothing. And okay. they don't want you defaulting on your accounts because it means that it's extra, it's, it's, it's effort for them. They have to know, go, go and spend resources to follow up with you, try and collect payments eventually hand it over to a debt collector and it's, it's just an absolute nightmare for them as well so they actually prefer you coming to them negotiating with you and um also i think one more thing to remember is when you contact them don't get angry <laughs> you, you, you definitely don't go into negotiation angry you're gonna get come out lost <laughs> For sure, for sure. Um, it's 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 all about being informative and going to the credit provider and uh, and addressing the issue as soon as possible. Yes, there's going to be instances where a credit provider may say, "Listen, uh, we've granted you extensions in the past, and you know we are at a point now where if we grant you the extension, remember the act also prevents a credit provider from acting recklessly." So a credit provider, sometimes we, we, we tend to put pressure on the credit provider to, 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 to put that arrangement in place. But is it then possible that the credit provider will be acting recklessly? by granting you that further sort of reprieve or rep further sort of uh, relief, you know? Uh, so that's also a question because, I mean, remember, they, they, they face compliance issues. They face possible mm. investigations by the NCR, by the regulator and stuff. So it's also that what we need to consider. At the end of the day, when, when obviously all the dust settles, it's about what action have you taken and what have you presented to the credit, to the credit provider. So it's about engagement. Just engage as much as you can. And at the end, there's only so much that can be done. And at, at, and remember, there are provisions in terms of the Act. The Act does give provisions for surrender of assets uh, in instances that you can't afford to keep it any longer. The Act does provide instances where you can consolidate your debt in some instances. That's why sometimes it, to maybe be proactive, say, listen, can I consolidate my debts into one sort of one sort of account so that I can have an easier installment every month? Believe me, there are options and you have to, you have to exhaust all of your options uh, so that you know more or less which is the best one for you in this at this moment in time. Yes, exactly. I think a very good example to give there is if you've got a home loan and you can get maybe a second bond on your on your bond. 
but you've also got um, credit cards or personal loans where you're paying an enormous amount on interest, <clears throat> then it would be wise to rather get that second bond at, let's say, prime interest rate of 7% and then paying off the credit cards and personal loans at what 20 percent whatever it, whatever it is we've we've seen people with enormous interest rates so it's you know, it's quite scary what, what's what's happening out there yeah believe me uh, i mean we don't profess to be financial advisors but i mean the the, the points that we're raising obviously are, is it's practical sense it's practical sense to, yes. to list your stuff down and say listen how can i reduce at the end of the day how can i reduce my debt at the same time uh free up a bit of disposable income because the disposable income is what's going to make your life better it's what's going to make you be able to maybe access other forms of uh, of uh of, of, of credit or, or, you know, or just make your status better overall. So it's about, I think it's about constant and consistency in your, in your personal finances. That's what I think it's all about. 100%. And if, if I can give everyone a tip on this webinar, if you want a good deal on your finance, make sure you increase your credit score, get a better credit score before you go and apply for the loan or apply for the finance. And that's where the most of the people make the biggest mistake is, they go and apply for finance and they don't know their credit score and only then do they find out, oh, I've got a listing here or I've got a blacklisting where it's exactly the, it's, it's the wrong thing to do. You need to first increase your credit score, then go apply for the finance, make sure you get the best possible deal and also negotiate with your bank. If you are getting, let's assume the prime interest rate is 7% like it is now and they're giving you a 9% um, deal, ask them, listen, yeah, I've got an excellent credit score, can I have a better deal? If you don't ask, you don't get and that's that's how you can save a tremendous amount of money if you just increase your credit score and that's what we're advocating if you guys want more information how to do it we've got a lot of videos on our youtube channel um you can also um there's, there's obviously a lot of information on our sites as well you can ask us questions reach out to us personally and if you have got black listings or bad listings that you feel was done incorrectly negotiate with your creditors try and get it removed if you can't get it removed go to the credit bureaus Get it removed there. And if that doesn't work, go to the credit ombud. That's exactly what they are there for. So, Lee, that brings us to the end of my questions. We've gone a little bit over our time. It was actually supposed to only be for around 45 minutes. So thank you very much for that. I don't know if you have got time for, for two or three questions. I do. I do. More than welcome. Okay, perfect. So let's take Martin Yevel. Yeah, he's actually been on our webinars quite a lot. So I'm very familiar with him. When one is wrongly flagged as being under debt management and the merchant cannot tell you who the credit bureau is who flagged you, who do one go to resolve the matter, the ombud or the NCR? Yeah, so that's actually quite a very interesting question. I'm sure that a lot of it, 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 it can add a lot of pressure and a lot of anxiety for a lot of people. Like I'm saying is that the Office of the Credit Ombud and the National Credit Regulator, we have been constantly engaging in these sort of issues recently. And I mean, um, so what you need to do is you need to follow the process. Contact the Bureau first, see if the Bureau can assist you. Because you remember, the credit bureau, as you, as you referred to previously, David, it's a holder of information. They get the information directly from uh, the, the system where that holds the information as to who should be under debt review and who shouldn't be under debt review. So start there. Once you get your reference number, if they cannot resolve the issue for you, approach the office of the credit ombud and we will engage with the necessary parties to ensure whether or not that information should be listed. Now, remember... If it is an issue whereby you've never applied for debt counseling or debt review, and for some reason you're being flagged for it, our current engagement with the NCR has been that we will, as, as organizations, sort of engage with one another to, to create processes. In fact, we're currently in the process of doing that, creating processes where consumers that fall into this category can be referred directly to the National Credit Regulator, and they will look into the process as to which debt counselor listed you. I mean, did you enter to debt counseling with a debt counselor? Why are they listing you? Uh, under debt counseling if you're not supposed to be listed under, under debt review. And I'll tell you where the misconception is. Consumers, sometimes they go to a debt counselor or to a debt review specialist and they, they, and they, and, and, and they go to, to, to request further information. But then what happens is that they, in some instances, sign information. My apologies for that. I think yeah, my computer was doing some funny stuff there. Uh, what happens is that they sign information or they sign documentation which they're not aware of, which in some instances is them entering into debt review. So consumers, please be aware of what you're signing. 
read what you sign, make sure that it's not binding you to something that you're not aware of. If you, if you have intention of applying for it, it's a different story. But the important thing is read what you sign because sometimes by just signing blindly, you are committing or rather you are committing yourself to something that you don't intend to and it can have consequences like the one that Mr. Mr. Hevel is finding himself in. So, Mr. Yeah. Martin, I, yes. yes. I think what happened with him, if I can remember correctly, is he in, entered into a debt review um, a process with a company and then the company went out of business or something. They were, they were gone and then he couldn't get hold of them and he was obviously still listed on the on the credit bureaus as being under debt review. And I think that was his biggest issue was getting that removed. And I know he's been struggling with that for, for a very long time. So it's very sad to hear that these things are actually happening. Um, I've, we've actually spoke to a, to a, um, a lawyer a few last year, and he's also a, debt, a registered debt counselor. And he said that a lot of the complaints he gets is people get into, into a debt review process where a, a salesperson found them and then put them into debt review without them even saying that they agree to be on debt review, which is absolutely crazy. And then he's actually, he's, a, he's had a few of those complaints where he sorted it out and that is exactly what, what happened. But I know since then in the old days, it was like that. It was very, uh, the debt review process or industry wasn't very, very regulated and every second person was a debt review or debt counselor. But I know the regulations have been quite strict on them um, they, you know, they, they heavily have regulated at the moment. So I don't think it happens quite as often as it used to. So, yeah, again, um, if you, if you by some chance are flagged for something that you didn't commit, uh, uh, commit yourself to follow the process immediately, believe me, that I think that our current, uh, or rather that we're in a better space now than we were years of years back. I think now, obviously the regulators and the ombuds and different bodies are now seeing the impact that, that this sort of situation is having on, on consumers. And I think they're putting places, uh, processes in place, or rather they, they're thinking of processes to assist consumers better. So I think we're in a much better space, but we can definitely assist um, uh, Martin in, in trying to resolve the dispute. Okay, so Martin, I see Martin is still um, he's still online. Yeah, he said, uh, thanks, Lee and David, useful. And so, so Martin, um, there was a few comments that replied to you as well. I assume this is from your office as well, um, Lee. So they gave you some details as well. You can uh, engage directly with the credit on, but they'll be able to help you. So I think that's the best way to go for you. So um, Lee, thank you very much. That brings us to the end of the, web of the webinar. I don't want to keep up too much of your time. I thank you very much for being on this webinar. You gave a lot of useful information. Um, I know a lot of people will find this very useful. I certainly did. And once again, thank you very much for your time. Um, if anyone needs to uh, reach out to the credit ombud, please reach out to them. You've got the details on here. Alternatively, go on Google, search for the credit ombud, and you will find their details. They are there to assist you as the credit consumer. So it is a really good entity to have in South Africa. I know we are actually very <laughs> unique in that sense that um, South Africa has a lot of these entities um, uh, you know, that, that um, protects us at the consumer. If you take something such as London, like the UK, something like uh, the, that the NCR doesn't even exist there. I remember a few years ago we were there and we they talked about the regulations coming out, regu regulating the personal loan industry. We sat there thinking like, holy crap, we've had this for years. <laughs> and that is supposed to be a first world. So yes, we've actually, it's a very um, a mat mature, mature financial market we've got. I, I think it's, um, Having you guys there and the NCR is a really good thing for the consumer and it's definitely a step in the right direction. So um, please remember guys, subscribe to the channel. We will be doing more videos like this in the future. There's lots of previous webinars that you can watch if you need more information on increasing your credit score or just the NCR, general information around personal finance. We share the same um, the same passion as um, Lee at the, at the Credit Ombud. We're there to protect you or to help you financial get get financial education and to become better citizens of south africa and um yes obviously the best way to get this out is for you guys to subscribe and share it with your friends and family lee thank you very much for your time we appreciate you being on this webinar and taking the time to be with us hopefully in the future we can do more webinars like this because the 58 minutes wasn't enough i've got i still got a lot of questions i would like to ask you <laughs> Not a problem. Thank you so much, David, for having us. Thank you for all the viewers that have tuned in. And yeah, I mean, we all, we're only here to assist as much as we can. And uh, we look forward to the next one. Thank you so much. Thanks, Lee. Take care. Bye-bye.